May I kindly request all the participants to have a seat, please? We are going to start event on 30 by 30 target in the Hindu Himalaya. So please have a seat. Respected parties, representatives of different national and international organizations, youth, indigenous people, and local communities, a very warm welcome to this event on 30 by 30 target in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. For the people who do not know about the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, it's a shared mountain range uh, shared by eight countries in the Asia, namely Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Myanmar. This mountain range not only share the physically the mountain range, but also we are connected through ecosystem, biodiversity, shared values, ethics, and uh, also culture. This region, our biodiversity is extremely rich, and this is the foundation for us to get connected. This is the base of our livelihoods. This is the base for sustainable development in the region. However, the region is also extremely at the uh, extremely threat with different kinds of changes. That's why protected area is one of the conservation, major conservation tool for conserving our biodiversity and prospering our life uh, for the current and the future generation. To discuss this further, we'll have representatives from People's Republic of China, Bhutan, uh, Isimot, Nepal, and GEF, Global Environmental Facility, to discuss about the status, challenges, barriers, and the prospects for the 30 by 30 target in the Hindu Kusimala region. For this, may I now would like to request Professor Uning, the Director General from Chengdu Institute of Biology, CAS, to come up to this stage. Second, may I also kindly request uh, Dr. Norbu Wangdi from Bhutan. I would also like to kindly request Mr. Dhananjay Paudel, sir, Joint Secretary from Ministry of Forest and Environment, Government of Nepal. And last but not least, I would like to invite um, Dr. Nakul Chetri, Senior Biodiversity Specialist working at International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And we have uh, um, Ms. Hana Fairbank from Global Environmental Facilities. So thank you. So now I would like to uh, ask questions to each of the representatives from the parties and also from the different organizations. So I'll first start with Dr. Nakul Chetri, who will brief about the status of protected areas in the Hindu Kush Himalaya as the foundation of our talk and discussion uh, of this event. Thank you, Sunita. It's my pleasure to bring you a very short introduction of Hindu Kush Himalayan region and its protected areas. <coughs> OK. So as it was in the, uh, informed by Sunita that we are working at International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, which is an intergovernmental organization working in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So this is the region that we are working, covering Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bhutan, China, India, Nepal, and Myanmar. So if you look at the history of protected areas in the HKS region, Hindu Kush Himalayan region, then it starts early in 90s or 1880s, and then subsequently quite substantial increase in number. And now you can see that almost 575 protected areas are already there. And it covers 40% of the terrestrial region of Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Next. 
So if you look at this slide, then you'll see the representative of protected areas in different ecoregions, which are covering different parts of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Next, please. And if you look at this slide, then these are the indications of protected area coverage in different bio biological diversity hotspots that are available in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. There are four in number, and each of those are represented in different proportion uh, in terms of biological, in, in terms of protected area coverage. Then you can see that some of those are only 50% coverage, and some of those are less than 50% coverage. But what is important to know in this particular slide is there are higher number of small protected areas in the mountains because the protected area of large scale is not feasible. So most of the protected areas are small and fragmented, and very few number of large scale or large uh, size protected areas are available. Next, please. So with this context, I think uh, we have to understand that what 30 by 30 means to us, because at least 53% uh, of Bhutan is already protected area, 23, above 23% above is already covered of Nepal, and uh, what it means in terms of 30 by 30, uh, and what is our stand of our member countries will be delivered by our colleagues. Thank you. So this was the brief reflection uh, of the status of protected area in the Hindu Kusimalaya region. So for this one, uh, this event is uh, about a discussion how we, what is the prospects, what are the success and challenges in the Hindu Kusimalaya region. So for this one, I would like to ask Professor Wu, like, how do you see uh, the prospect of 30 by 30 target in uh, China? F Professor Wu. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear friends, colleagues from the Hindu Kuskima regions and uh, all of the world. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this interactive session. Uh, because the, the China, as you know, is a big country with a very diverse environment. So, especially in the western part of the China, it's uh, the very rich in the biodiversity. I come from the Chengdu, the Shan province. This is uh, the located in the, the the southwest mountain of the China. This is the, world, the global biodiversity hotpot place. So I work there, and uh, so before that, I also work in Yusin mode in the all of the, the Kima, uh, Hindu Kuskima region. So for this region, protect areas is very important because in, only in China side, there is over the 400 uh, the, the protect areas. But now the China also restructured the protect area the system. So we established the, the new national park, for example, like the Giant Panda the National Park. In the, this is located in the center of this southwest mountain areas of China. So at least uh, uh, up to now, there are, o there are over the 12,000 protected areas in China. And uh, uh, these protected areas have covered the, about the 20% of the territories, uh, 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 the, the, the land areas. But this is not enough because we know we also try our best to protect the more biodiversity as uh, the important areas. So uh, in addition to the protected areas, we also promote like the heritage site, irrigation heritage site, agriculture important heritage site. In this way, we want to protect more the areas for biodiversity importance. So I believe in the futures, the China also want to cooperate with other member countries from the Hindu Kush of Himalayan regions, the focus on the transboundary landscapes. They, because for all of the uh, Hindu Kush uh, uh, Himalayan regions, the transboundary landscape should be protected. 
this is our priority in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Runing, for highlighting the importance of protected areas, but more importantly, how we need to conserve uh, ecosystem biodiversity beyond the border at the transboundary uh, scales in cooperation with other countries of the Hindu Kosimala region. With this uh, very good note, now I would like to go to Bhutan to ask Dr. Wang Di uh, about Bhutan because Bhutan has been very successful in terms of protected areas coverage. They already have like 54 or uh, more than 54 percent of protected areas. So I would like to ask Dr. Wang Di, what are the success factors that has led the country Bhutan in uh, terms of protected areas, especially in target three? Dr. Wang Di. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's uh, wonderful to be here. I think this is my first uh, COP uh, conference that I'm attending after 12 years of service in the government and then one in almost uh, two years of service in an NGO. Uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. I think Isimot uh, for this uh, platform today. Uh, in terms of uh, the success factors, I think, uh, first of all, I think we had uh, leadership. Leadership is very important. We had uh, leadership with vision. We already had the vision of uh, living in harmony with nature since uh, our, like the first uh, developmental uh, uh, plants in 1960s. So we started, we already had the philosophy of living with nature in harmony with nature. So our uh, far-sighted visions, I think they had uh, leaders, they had a strong vision for such a tiny like country like uh, Bhutan, I think landlocked. We already had that uh, notion, uh, realization that, okay, living in harmony with nature would be the future for Bhutan. So that's why today, I think all the uh, agendas or any kind of platforms, we have been a forerunner in terms of biodiversity conservation, uh, as well as environmental conservation, and also in the uh, pursuit of uh, economic development agenda. So we have been a forerunner in balancing the uh, needs of the communities as well as the sustainable development approach. So I think leadership was uh, one of the key uh, successful factors. Uh, another thing was there was a strong uh, support from the communities. We also had uh, strong uh, policy and legal frameworks, institutional frameworks, right from the beginning of, uh, in terms of uh, natural resource governance or environmental resource uh, governance. So those are certain key factors. And then, of course, uh, nevertheless, we also had uh, strong international support from the global communities in terms of uh, enhancing our uh, conservation efforts in Bhutan. So those are, I think, a few uh, points that I would like to state uh, at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang Di. While we are talking about the whole society approach, only recently, Bhutan has been practicing this since last, since few years. So we need to tap this on in the region to really progress on protected areas in the region. So now we would like to uh, request uh, Dhananjay Paudel, sir, from Ministry of Environment and Forest in Nepal, because Nepal has also been very ahead in terms of conservation and it's in fact a pioneer in community-based approaches. So now I would like to consider like with 30, 30 prospect in Nepal, what are the challenges now if the country really wants to achieve this target in the region? Dr. Powell. Uh, first of all, thank you, madam, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to address this session. And uh, I will start from the uh, prospects and challenges, okay? Uh, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, GF representative and uh, dignitaries in this dais, uh, colleagues from ECMOD, uh, Nepalese delegation, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank ECMOD for organizing this session. And uh, we have the opportunity to discuss here about uh, the success and challenges uh, of uh, achieving the target 3030 uh, in Nepal. Uh, I would like to start uh, the forest status as well as uh, status of protected area system in Nepal first, and then I will go through the challenges and opportunities uh, for achieving the 3030 target. Okay, right now, uh, Nepal has about 45% of the land covered with forest. Uh, and these forests are managed under different management uh, systems. 
we have also uh, a further commitment through NDC that we will achieve, uh, I, we will uh, make forest cover 45% by 2030. And uh, I think uh, you all know that Nepal is renowned and a pioneer country uh, about participatory forest management. And in participatory forest management, there are different modalities of inclusion of local people for the management of their accessible forest. And uh, um, mostly, uh, widespread uh, modality is community forest, uh, which, co uh, which cover almost 35% of the forest land in the country. And then uh, other modalities include pro-poor legal forestry uh, part, uh, and uh, collaborative forest management. Altogether, these participatory forest management modality, modalities uh, cover about 40% of the forest land in Nepal. And uh, in terms of protected areas, actually Nepal has uh, right now about 24% uh, about of the uh, land area has been declared as protected area and uh, which is protected under different categories of IUCN protected area system. Nepal welcomes the target three of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And we have uh, also joined hands with international community and showed our firm commitment in high ambition coalition also for reaching the 3030 target. And uh, talking about the opportunity, we have ample opportunity for the fulfillment of the uh, 3030 target in Nepal. The National Forest Policy 2019 has also the provision of providing recognition to traditionally conserved forest area by local communities other than internationally recognized protected areas as community conserved areas. The policy provides an overarching framework for 3030 target in the country. Uh, but we are actually new to OECMs. Uh, thus, we need to sensitize and make aware of where the indigenous people, local communities, and other stakeholders about OECM and its significance in our context. We have now started the process of formulating standard guidelines and framework uh, to declare OECM adopting inclusive, equitable governance approaches so that an effective implementation of OECM could be possible. And at the same time, we are also uh, serious about the concerns and rights of the indigenous people and local communities could be secured. The achievement of the 3030 target in the country also requires human and financial resources, as well as innovation and tools to manage human wildlife conflicts for better and shared future for all. So uh, finally, I would like to thank again Isimurt for the opportunity to share our insights and we look forward to working in partnership with all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pordel, sir. So for highlighting how the opportunity we have, especially for OECM in Nepal, but the, at the same time, we might have other challenges like human resources, financial resources to fulfill this target. So that comes to, uh, takes me to uh, Ms. Hana from GEF, like, you know, to achieve the target, uh, the financial resources is one of the important uh, enabling condition and the um, requirement for us to achieve this in the region. So my question to GEF, Ms. Hana, is like, what financial opportunities we have if we, we really want to achieve this 30 by 30 target uh, in the country of, in each of the country of the hindu Himalaya region? Ms. Hana. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, okay, better. Thank you so much, Sunita, and I'll try to keep my comments brief. This is a real pleasure for me. I wish we could spend another hour discussing, but maybe in the hallways. My name's Hannah Fairbank, and I'm the Asia Regional Coordinator for the Jeff Secretariat and a Senior Biodiversity Specialist there, and it's really been my great pleasure to work very closely with all of the countries um, that you all represent here on the stage and throughout the region. Um, really some exciting conservation programs going on. So um, I have just three things to introduce today. One, um, 
the Global Environment Facility just um, concluded uh, our largest replenishment process ever. Most of you have probably um, contributed in some way, uh, either technically, um, uh, intellectually, or um, if you're from a donor country, um, uh, to that replenishment. So five point. $33 billion for a four-year period, our largest replenishment ever. The biodiversity focal area is uh, the largest focal area in the GEF um, with $1.92 billion uh, over that four-year period. And then uh, applying the Rio markers, we're expecting up to 60% of the GEF 8 replenishment resources to have biodiversity um, outcomes, which is really exciting. Um, for the Asia region overall, that's $550 million. Um, um, uh, and $330 million for biodiversity uh, alone. So the Jeff 8 programming directions is very ambitious and it's really built around uh, being nature pos helping countries be nature positive by 2030 um, and carbon neutral and pollution free by 2050. So that's our broad brush strategy. Um, how are we going to work with countries to do that? First and foremost, we're taking a healthy uh, people, healthy planet approach, um, you know, really recognizing the interconnectedness of people, people's health and the health of uh, the planet through policy coherence. Um, and resource mobilization. So going down just one level to the biodiversity strategy for Jeff 8, um, which really gets to kind of the meat of where the um, resources come and how um, we can help support countries to meet their commitments under the target three of the GBF draft. Um, so first, uh, you know, the biodiversity strategy for Jeff, Jeff 8 was absolutely um, designed to help countries meet the commitments um, under the post-2020 uh, GBF that we are now watching come uh, in, into play. And then also uh, based on strong science and evidence. So I really appreciated the, the um, uh, presentation on the status of protected areas in the region. Um, and then really provides a comprehensive um, response to drivers of biodiversity loss. So if you look at the biodiversity uh, strategy, we have three um, objectives. The first one, um, uh, is, is very focused on the conservation, uh, sustainable use, um, and restoration of biodiversity. The second is on the protocols specifically, and then the third is on resource mobilization. So we kind of cover all of that. Keeping in mind, though, that Jeff 8 um, actually has 11 uh, integrated programs or IPs as they're known and those are designed to help countries address um, those systemic drivers and transform the systems that are leading to environmental degradation degradation across all of the multilateral environmental um, agreements we serve. So everything from sustainable cities um, to, to food systems. Um, we have a new one on infrastructure development, greening infrastructure development. I work on the wildlife integrated program. Happy to talk to you more about those. Um, but this really reflects an evolution in the, the Jeff biodiversity portfolio and our approach overall, um, which is following where the countries are going and, and obviously where the convention is going into a much more systemic integrated approach to, to addressing drivers. So in terms of um, uh, GBF, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, in terms of opportunities for financing um, to meet target three of, of the GBF. So while we do work um, clearly through this objective one, we'll be supporting a variety of approaches, including protected areas, OECMs, um, and then including strong engagement with indigenous peoples and local uh, communities. Uh, we had an interesting event yesterday that really highlighted um, the need not just to meet the percentages, but also look at um, quality and effectiveness and inclusiveness about how this target is met. Um, and so uh, within the biodiversity strategy, there is room for all of that. And then obviously getting involved in these um, uh, integrated programs is a great opportunity for countries. Just making sure that the right and left hands are working together in terms of policy coherence, um, which then will provide uh, further resources um, and resource mobilization. So I think, um, you know, in conclusion, um, I just wanted to call everybody's attention to a small investment that the Jeff made at the end of Jeff 7, which is supporting the development of a guide to national planning for inclusively and effectively meeting um, the GBF target three and then supporting um, six countries to actually start that planning process. So Nepal is, is one of those six countries um, and there will be a larger event 
that those countries will be involved in and others hopefully um, at the Jeff Assembly, the seventh Jeff Assembly in August um, of 2023 in Vancouver, British Columbia. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hannah, for highlighting so many opportunities for the region, especially for a 2030 target, but in general, biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable management, including especially for indigenous people and local communities in the region. So with this one, because with this is an interactive session, so I would like to take a few questions from the floor uh, for our respective uh, panel members. So any questions? So... Can you please raise your hand? Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, namaskar, I'm Pasangdol Masirpa from Nepal. Uh, very glad to see our um, uh, representative from Nepal and also from um, different uh, regions from Asia. Uh, I work for Center for Indigenous People Research and Development uh, based in Kathmandu, Nepal, but we have been also working in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, yeah, I just would like to, uh, you know, how you have been seen like uh, 30 by 30 uh, target is a really uh, ambitious, uh, but we have also challenges on the ground, no doubt, especially with the indigenous peoples and local community issues and concerns, uh, our livelihoods issues, and also traditional practices. So especially uh, how you have been envisioning uh, uh, for recognition of the traditional uh, customary institution that has been basis for the uh, you know whole intact of the uh, knowledge system and culture and and values and contribution for the intact of the biodiversity ecosystem and that has been one of the target i believe with the 30 by 30 thank you thank you so much and that question is for so anyone so would like to respond yeah Thank you, Madam, for your concern. Actually, uh, uh, talking about Nepal, yeah, uh, though we are new uh, about 3030 uh, agenda, how to implement it uh, in uh, real ground, but there is no difficulty, I think, uh, in Nepal because we, ha we have already reached uh, about 24, uh, 23 point something percentage of land area as protected area system. It, it has already been under protected area management system. Then we, we also have about 35% of the land, forest land, uh, already handed over to local communities. So there is a system already in place. Just we, we have to declare and we have to secure rights and responsibilities and benefit sharing mechanisms should be made more transparent, how we can may, make it. And uh, we, have, we have to recognize the rights actually for the indigenous people and local communities. Because Nepal government, has already recognized uh, the role and uh, uh, contribution of the local people and indigenous people uh, for the management of the uh, natural resources as well as biodiversity. So we are in the process of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, de devising guideline also. And after the endorsement of uh, global biodiversity framework by this uh, convention, uh, Nepal will start immediately uh, the process of uh, declaring, uh, I mean, preparing a guideline first and then declare OECMs. So I think that it will not hamper the rights and responsibilities of the uh, indigenous people and local communities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dhananjay, sir, for highlighting the role of indigenous people and how it has been envisioned in the policy. So I have another question from here. Hi, I'm Shama. I'm from India, working with WCS. Uh, from the, uh, the fact that Nepal is also a disaster prone region and ecologically fragile area. Uh, given that, do you think 30 by 30 target could uh, like prevent or at least uh, mediate such situations? And also uh, in your framework, would you also be considering how to future proof uh, or make the land more uh, disaster resilient? I mean, will 30 by 30 have something on that? Thank you. Thank you for that question, and I think I'll give to Nepal, and then I'll also pass to others to reflect on this. 
uh, what I understand from you is that uh, how we, c we can make uh, a resilient as well. Uh, yeah? uh, I mean, uh, while achieving the target 3030, we also uh, have to consider the resilience. So, uh, you are right that Nepal is actually, uh, Nepal has a mo most of the area uh, fragile landscape. And basically, Churi area and Himalayan, uh, I mean, high Himal region, uh, there is also the participation and uh, involvement of local uh, people and communities. We, we also have side by side uh, water, I mean, uh, watershed management activities, which we implement side by side through the uh, local people. So I think we, we'll, we are still conscious on it. And uh, your suggestion is right that we have also to include th th that activity while implementing OECM. Declaring and implementation of OECM. Yeah, so we have a question for Bhutan. Thank you, Shinta. Uh, my question is, uh, you see, Bhutan, you have already allocated uh, more than 50% of the land for protected area. Then what is your uh, motivations for this 30 by 30? And uh, if you talk about the OECM, it, it uh, demands the conservation of area beyond the protected areas. So what are the opportunities you have to, to manage? Maybe you may need to reform your policy institution. So how, how you are uh, seeing it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think uh, in terms of uh, OECM, uh, Bhutan uh, is also, I mean, uh, had already started uh, identification of key biodiversity areas. I think that is one uh, form of entry. And just like Nepal, we all. We also have uh, uh, community forest uh, management. So already our uh, forest governance is also decentralized to the communities. So communities, they are. There are more than uh, 800 plus uh, for community forests uh, identified in Bhutan. So that is uh, another. Uh, then in terms of uh, the OECMs, we are also taking uh, initiative of uh, landscape-based approaches for critical uh, habitats. So uh, working together with communities to protect the uh, ecosystems, particularly the riverine ecosystems and other systems. So. Uh, I think it's basically uh, we have already achieved the target of uh, 30 by 30, but then we are more than 50 percent. But still, I think uh, we want to uh, maximize the benefit from the uh, already uh, high uh, natural resources that we have, high cover of forest resources, and uh, that is our strength uh, at the community. So we really want to derive the maximum benefit from it. So we are working together with communities to again, uh, enhance uh, protection of the community lands and uh, community forests. So that would be our, uh, and then at the same time, I think we can uh, incentivize the communities for uh, enhancing uh, socioeconomic development along with uh, uh, sustaining the ecosystem resources uh, for uh, future generations. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> question to Jeff, representative. The parties here are uh, asking for a separate global biodiversity fund, and you already have a biodiversity window or a focal area in the GEF, uh, you know. So uh, what are your views on having a separate funding mechanism for biodiversity? Uh, how would it relate to what Jeff is already doing? And congratulations on the largest replenishment. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the congratulations on the replenishment. Um, this issue is for the party to, parties to decide. The Jeff will continue to serve the convention uh, and do the great work that we do um, to support all of your countries with the, with the financing that we have. So thanks for your question. We're excited to, to see the outcome of the next two weeks. It's an exciting time. Well, I can continue with the similar question to you, Hannah. Uh, see our association with Jeff and protected areas, they go together for 20, 30, 40 years. Ever since we started moving into PAs, we knew that there was a Jeff for the funding arm, and you know about the investments of Jeff in India. Now, the story of OECM is starting. 
and there is a lot of expectation there too that as uh, some jeff fundings and projects have been unlocked for protected areas is there any thought that uh, there could be a special allocation for oecms of course countries will have to submit their proposals but i am share with you that there is a lot of expectation because people have in their minds that uh, pas do get funding of course they do get funding by writing project defending project and you know how difficult it is uh, to get a jeff fund as well notwithstanding that there is a legitimate expectation for people whom we want their lands to be designated as part of oecm so i want to know from you that is there any thought process of separately allocating funds for oecm which of course countries can pitch it together i also work for wcpa iuc and wcpa we can combine with the countries in the region we have bhutan nepal bangladesh india here present we could we could also submit a regional proposal if 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 there were a possibility of either country accessing this i know jeff fundings have to be accessed by countries but i want to hear from you that uh, if we as south asia region were to submit a proposal for oecm designation management monitoring will it be possible to do so thank you thanks for the question i just want to check on timing so i will give a brief answer and i'd love to talk to you afterwards cuz this seems like maybe a longer conversation just for the benefit of of everyone so the jeff is um country demand driven which means uh we set a broad strategy that is responsive to the conference of the parties um on a cyclical basis obviously uh and then we look to jeff agencies and jeff uh governments um working in in partnership with cso's and others uh to put together projects so that's first and foremost uh what we have seen is a little bit of an evolution that i alluded to in my initial comments of how countries are designing and and the focus of those projects under the jeff strategies um from a more traditional protected areas based approach to biodiversity conservation um into more landscape and seascape level conservation approaches which is tracked kind of the international biodiversity conservation uh trends over the last 30 years um and so what we have seen coming in from countries has also tracked that just the the number and and resources given to more integrated approaches and so jeff a then puts us in a much more integrated uh position with this big strategy which is exciting um but the biodiversity uh strategy still has this objective one and it does still hold space for protected particularly protected area system strengthening and um a uh, financial sustainability of those systems um but it's broader than that it really is focused on landscape and seascape level conservation and one of the the one of those most pieces of that mosaic is obviously OACMs and so it's squarely within objective one of the biodiversity strategy for JEF 8 um so i'm not i won't comment specifically on any proposed ideas around that um but objective one of the Jeff 8 strategy which is we just had our first work program approved by council last week um um is off and running um and i'm really excited to work with um india and and other co uh, countries in the region um to see what your ideas are for Jeff 8 um uh i am often times on the other end of those portal submissions uh so um happy to speak with you offline thanks so much Thank you so much Hana. So I have last question for Professor Uning because we are talking about regional collaboration and at Isimod we really try our best to uh promote and work uh, at the regional cooperation level. So my question to Professor Uning is how is it possible? It is possible but like from now on especially for this 30 by 30 target how we can come together and work at the regional scale especially for 30 by 30 target in the region Professor Uning. so i think the <laughs> this is challenging questions um but in the last uh, over the 20 years uh the china has to cooperate with uh, the uh, the the neighboring countries like uh, nepal the pakistan and uh, they working uh, together on the the transboundary landscape conservation 
Uh, and as we know, in the Hindu Kimala regions, we have already established uh, the mining protected areas. But the uh, mining uh, protected areas is uh, like the isolate the island. So I think in the future, uh, just mention uh, like the uh, people mentioned the OECM, it can be used uh, to uh, to promote the connectivities and the integrities of the protected areas. And uh, so this promote the, the conservation in the landscape scale. So I think this is very helpful for us to cooperate with the other countries in the Hindu Himalayan regions. Of course, for China, we also uh, think we should learn uh, from each other. And uh, so for example, like uh, Nepal and Bhutan, they have the very good experience in the community's forest uh, the conservation. And uh, so, uh, and we also can cooperate in the composite building and how to promote the OECM and other protected areas. And uh, we can cooperate in the, the big scales yes, across the Himalaya. I think this, we have many opportunities in the future for the transboundary cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wu. Now we are already at the end of our program, and to complete this, uh, to end this, uh, I kindly request Dr. Knuckle to give brief remarks and end the event. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, in conference of party meeting and these kind of side events, and talking about mountains. Uh, as it was already mentioned, that uh, mountains are contiguous. There is no, no the, the, in biodiversity and ecology, there is no border. So that's why all the eight countries are brought over here, and then the, 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 the resources, uh, mobilization opportunities is also being explored. And uh, we have discussed a couple of uh, things uh, which will be very instrumental in your future. So I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants out here and also uh, our representative from Jeff uh, and our colleagues from ECMOD and our panelists for bringing this perspective of uh, 30 by 30. Uh, just one small note, I think uh, Mathurji is here uh, who is uh, very instrumental in you know, conceiving and also promoting, advocating OECM in India, uh, that this 30 by 30 is, a, uh, is not a national you know, target that is mandatory. So it is a, a global target that is contributing by national targets, uh, whatever feasible way that is possible. So that perception need to be clarified. It is not country-wise target. Uh, and uh, uh, our contribution from the Himalayan region is already 40% 40, 40 coverage already indicated. Uh, but as Professor Wooning was telling that uh, in the perspective of climate change, in the perspective of contiguity, in the perspective of island uh, concept of uh, protected area that exists, the connectivity corridors uh, and the regional cooperation uh, is uh, very, very inevitable uh, aspects. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is also critically important for you know, countries like uh, developing countries and uh, you know, underdeveloped countries to get resources and also in incentivize those countries which are already, you know, uh, I mean, sacrificing rather 53% uh, of the countries uh, as a protected area uh, at the cost of you no know, uh, implications of human wildlife conflict and other consequences. So hopefully in near future, Things will be uh, no, uh, improved and then uh, no, we'll be able to contribute more. Uh, but also importantly is to balance conservation as well as uh, uh, human uh, no, uh, livelihood as well as uh, the consequences of uh, uh, conservation that is impinging uh, the cost of life and uh, livestock depredation uh, as well as other economic loss that is emerging and hopefully in near future uh, some sort of balance mechanism will be devised and will agree uh, will reach to this 3030 target uh, collectively from the HKS region as well so with this i would like to conclude over here and thank you very much sunita for this wonderful uh, organization of this event thank you
Yeah, thank you so much with this positive note. And then we'd also like to thank you all the participants for coming here, devoting their time and asking questions to the, all the panelists. We have a small gift for all the participants. So just to end with the positive note, please kindly come here and uh, collect your small gift from us, from the Himalaya region, in the Kusi Himalaya region. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening.
Ça m'a dit le fort en plus. Parfait, ça, parce que euh, j'en je, vois très fort. Et là, 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 là. Parce que là, il euh, n'y a personne qui parle à stick un volume de dom comme moi. Là. Eh, eh, eh. Parfait. Laisse ça là. Je ne touche plus rien. Eh, 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 eh. Bah. Bon. 